Hallelujah. I want us to pray just one prayer in addition to the prayers we have prayed. Say, Father, I'm in your presence today. Let me have a special touch. Touch me in a special way. Open your mouth and pray in the name of Jesus. Father, we are in your presence this morning. Separate us for a special touch this morning. Touch us in a special way. Touch us in a special way today. Lord God Almighty, we are in your presence. Touch us in a special way today. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Lord, we ask this morning that as we share together, as we learn at your feet, Lord Jesus, you are the best teacher. We ask that you come and teach us by yourself today. In the name of Jesus. And as you teach us, open our understanding to that which you want us to know. That will bring change and transformation and vibrancy to your church that you have put in our care in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Let's be seated. We are all blessed in Jesus' name. I want to welcome you again to the second day of this summit. Open your material with me to page 20. Page number 20. Seven million more vibrant churches to go. Seven million more vibrant churches to go. Some of us might be wondering, why are we so specific about having seven million more churches before the end will finally come? Now, we are able to arrive at this figure based on the revelation of the Lord to some great commission-minded leaders that before the rapture will take place, we still need seven million more vibrant churches. Not churches that will be up today and down tomorrow. Churches that will be lively, churches that will be alive, churches that will be vibrant, churches that will always bring glory to the name of the Lord. Now, I want to say this, that this is not the maximum. This is minimum. It could be more. In fact, it will gladden the heart of God if we are able to plant more than 7 million vibrant churches before the Lord arrives. And I pray that the grace to fulfill this great commission so that it doesn't become great omission, the Lord will give unto us in the name of Jesus. I want to read Deuteronomy chapter 6. I will read from verse 4. To nine. Deuteronomy chapter 6 from verse 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hands, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy eye, house, 
and on thy gates. I pray that the word of the Lord and these teachings will register in our hearts and we will be able to transmit them to others in the name of Jesus. Now from the material, the great commandment, according to that Romans chapter 6 verse 5, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Is a great commandment which must lead to the fulfillment of the great commission. According to that Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, that says that, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Now, it takes deep love in our hearts for God to be able to be truly committed to this great commission that has been given to us. Now, I put something here in my material that we must be obedient to the great commander who gave the great commandment and be committed to the great commission in order to make great impact in this great world of great opportunities so that the great commission will not become the great omission. If we are not obedient to the great commander who gave the great commission, then the great commission will become great omission. I pray. The great commission will not become the great omission in our lives in Jesus' name. So new congregations, replant and revitalize and relaunch of old churches are vitally needed if we are to fulfill the great commission. Now these seven million local churches is what the Holy Spirit has been revealing to his great commission-minded leaders over the last several years. And we have some facts to validate this. Number one is the issue of population explosion. Now, the world population is about 7.6 billion as at 2016. Now, yesterday, I had to begin to research. If we have 7.5 billion in the world as at 2016, then between 2016 and now, what is the world population? You know, I discovered that the world population as at this month of March 2019 is 7,714,576,923. Which could summarily be summed as 7.7 .7 billion. You can go and Google it. You can research it. Because I actually want a situation where we have current statistics. So that we will be current and be correct. So the world population could be is now about 7.7 .7 billion. Now, only about 3.5 billion are born again. What we have here, 3.2 billion as at 2016. But as at March this year, it has gone up to 3.5 billion who are born again. Now, over 4 billion are unsaved. And this is to tell us that the harvest is truly ripe. And like I always love to say, there has never been a time that the harvest is as ripe as it is now. The Bible says, then the harvest was ripe. It's like the harvest has not even gotten to any level as it is now. With the current world population statistics. 
Now, number two, the percentage of nominal Christians are increasing daily. Christians who are only Christians by name, Christians who claim to be coming to church, but who do not have a transforming encounter with the Lord. Those who do not really know God. And we can see examples all around us, all over this nation, especially every Sunday. You see every Tom Dick Canary carrying Bibles and moving towards churches. And when you see the way some people are dressed, you begin to wonder, are these people going to a party or going to a social club? Now, the percentage of nominal Christians, they are increasing daily. Today, there are 45,000 denominations in the world. It has even gone more than that. These 45,000 denominations are denominations that can be recognized. Denominations that you can say this one is a denomination. Who have branches here and there. Now, there are 3.2 billion Christians in the world as at 2016. As at March, the month we are in now, there are 3.5 billion Christians in the world. And you know the funniest thing? United States of America has the largest Christian population in the world. Followed by Brazil. Then the third on the list is Mexico. So these three nations, United States of America, Brazil, and Mexico, according to Wikipedia, has the largest number of Christians. So in our nation here, when I was checking the statistics, I discovered that we are even not very close to the first ten. God will help us in Jesus' name. I think, according to the statistics, Nigeria is about number 16 or 17. That has the largest number of Christians in the world. Now, out of this, Roman Catholic has 1.1 billion as at 2016. But as at December last year, December 2018, the Roman Catholic population has moved up to 1.2 billion. So they are the ones that still are the largest population. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that we have more of nominal Christians than real genuine Christians. And that is to also tell us that we still have a lot of work to do. And God is counting on you, God is counting on me to plant vibrant and varied churches for him. And the grace the Lord will release upon us in Jesus' name. Now the Protestants, they are between 900 million and 1 billion. Why Orthodox churches, their population is between 20, 260 million to 268 million. The Pentecostals, Pentecostals have between 320 million to 360 million. Now, Charismatics, 301 million. According to the statistics that I got yesterday. Then the Evangelicals, they have between 295 million to 300 million. Now, considering all, Christian growth rate, all Christian growth rate, Islam is 1.9 percent and is indeed growing faster than Christianity that is growing at the rate of 1.2 percent. 
But evangelical Christianity growth rate of 2.6% is faster than Islam that is growing at 1.9%. Which means evangelical Christians are growing faster than Islam and twice faster than Buddhism that is growing at the rate of 1.3% and Hinduism that is growing at the rate of 1.2%. Though there had been tremendous growth of evangelical Christianity in Africa, in Asia, and Latin America in the last 30 years, however, there is remarkable decline of true Christianity in Europe, in Africa, and North America. Because the once vibrant, living, and vital churches are gradually losing life, and they are now imbibing religious spirits. We have more churches in all these continents that have imbibed religious spirit. People who only gather to fulfill religious obligation. I pray the Lord will help also. Then, the third fact is that each local church must win, must impact, and transform 50% of our locality. Pastors and church leaders, I want to say this to us. How many of us and how many of our churches are transforming our locality to this percentage? We have the mandate to, to win, to impart and transform at least 50% of the people in our locality, which means we are to make great impact in that community where our churches are located. That at least 50% of the people there will be impacted for Christ. So in the community where our churches are located, our churches must not become mere figures, but rather become a mighty kingdom force in that locality. The church must be impactful in a local community and be a transforming agent. It is then the Great Commission will not become the Great Omission. Then number four, each church must have strong food in a locality, but have our eyes in the world for Christ. What does that imply? It means the presence of the church must be strong in our locality. And as strong as it is, the eyes of the church must be in the world. And that is to say that the church must be prepared to send men, to send money and materials to affect the world for Christ positively. Even though we have strong footing in our locality, our eyes must be in the world because there are still more people in the world that are yet to come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we thank God for the few number of people we have in our congregation, we should also strive to reach out to more people. Then number five, proliferation of churches is when there is one church for 500 people. How many churches for 500 people? One church. In your local church, do you have up to 500 people? Hmm? We don't have. And yes, some people are, are crying that there are proliferation of churches. Now, as long as there is only one church for about 5 million, for 3 million people, there is nothing like proliferation of churches. There is need for us to plant more churches to cater for smaller number of groups of people. May God help us. Number six, intentional and deliberate production of disciples. Thank God this is a disciple-making church planting summit. There must be intentional 
and deliberate production of disciples that will be released after we have made them disciples, after they have truly become the disciples of the Lord, then we must release them to go and disciple others. Now, manpower development, training and modeling are all crucial. Churches must invest in this every day. We must invest in making people to become disciples. And those people that have become disciples, they should go ahead and disciple other people. And we must be intentional and we must be deliberate in our discipleship drive. We have to raise more disciples for Christ. And as we do this, we will not miss it in Jesus' name. Now, what are the way out? What is the way out? The major way out to reach this goal of having 7 million more vibrant churches is planting a house church. That's a major way. If this goal is to be accomplished, then we must try as much as possible to plant house churches. Now, planting a new church using the house church model may not be as dramatic as some other methods, but it does have much to commend it and to start it. It may not be as dramatic as other methods, but it's a method that will really be of help to us in order to be able to achieve this goal of 7 million more vibrant churches. Now, it can be accomplished by other people than professional ministers. What do we mean by this? Now, starting a house church does not necessarily mean that you start with ordained and called ministers. It could be started with people who have imbibed the great commission spirit. After we have taught them that they have been saved to rise up for the salvation of others. Now, those who are really on fire for God could be motivated. They don't have to necessarily be people whom we have poured oil on in the name of ordination. They might not really be people who have actually sensed the calling of God into full-time ministry. But people who have received the calling to reach out to more people. Those who have imbibed the spirit of, I have been saved to rise up for the salvation of others. So, starting an out church could be accomplished by people other than professional ministers. Then, two, it can be accomplished in a low-profile manner, escaping the unwanted attention that starting a church will easily draw. You know, in some instances, starting a house church, many people will not know that the house church will eventually become full-fledged church. But when you start it in a low profile, maybe in the house of somebody, like this, our usual house fellowship or our cell group, you know, you don't draw too much attention. In fact, where you are living in the living room, where such is being started, the landlord might not even know that what you are Starting there is a church. You just start as a fellowship without attracting unnecessary attention to yourself. Because ordinarily, there are some places where we go to start churches that the people in the community will vehemently fight against us. But starting with a house church, till the level it will grow, to the time you will now begin to look for a space 
or a particular vacant plot of land or whatever, or a hall in the area, you will have grown to a certain level. And by the time you will move there, that is when people will know that of a truth, a church has started. In fact, some people might not even know that it is the same house fellowship that metamorphosed into a church that is using a hall. May God give us wisdom. Oh. Then facilities for meeting are much more readily available than public halls. This is made possible because you start in the house of somebody. Probably a member or a close person in the church. Abroad, that your apartment. We want to come and start something there. As a house fellowship and the thing will begin to grow gradually. So, the, 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 the pressure of looking for money to rent a place, you don't have that at the beginning. Then the small group gives opportunity for developing strong relationship. Because when people gather together to fellowship together, relationship becomes stronger as they get to know one another, one-on-one -on -one and two-by-two. Two. Then the informality of a house encourages people to relax more. Many people will have gone too far with you in the fellowship before they will realize that they have become a part of a great movement. So what are the strategies for planting a house church? Number one, target a particular village or a particular town. Always endeavor to be open and sensitive to the Holy Spirit in respect to what he may show you about a particular place. God still shows location to his ministers by putting burdens of that particular community, that particular locality in their hearts. Now realize that when some particular places begin to come before your mind regularly, it may be that the Holy Spirit is directing your thoughts and concern towards those places. So you must begin to pray about that particular village or about that particular town. Ask God to show you what he wants you to do there. Begin to visit the place. You can drive or walk around that place. Get the feel of the place. And let God speak to you while you are actually there. There are places God will lay upon our hearts. Let's take the courage to go to those places. And as we get there, we should be praying, God, what will you have me do in this particular place? This place you have led me to come. What exactly do you want me to do here? And if you know how to seek his face, he will show you his mind and tell you what he has for you. I pray the Lord will sharpen our spiritual sensitivity to be sensitive to his move and his direction in the name of Jesus. Pray for the place as you walk around it. Try to see the place from God's own perspective and try to share his feelings about the people there. Number two, form a team of workers. Form a team of workers. As you begin to pray about a particular place, you will often discover that others also are interested and concerned about that particular place. Now, I remember the story a pastor friend told me. He had his church not too far from this area then. We were discussing one day and he said he has a body for a particular community around Mowe. I said, have you truly prayed very well about the place? He said he has been praying that it's like God is leading him 
to that place. He said, no problem. I said, first of all, go there. Go to the community. Go and have a feel of that particular place. Now, by the time he came back, he told me that when he got to Moe, and began to walk around some areas there, that the body was so strong upon him that he now began to pray, Lord, I am now sure you want me to come here. Which particular area are you going to give us as a location in this place? He said he didn't receive anything. Then he came back. After he told me that, I said, call your workers together in the church. Share that vision and body with them. And he went on and shared the body with them. You know the surprising thing? Two brothers in his church, who are workers, said they have been having body for that particular site. One of them said, the very time, the very day, he followed the other brother, who had a parcel of land in Moe, to that place, that the body to bring the church to that place, I've been in his heart too. I now said to the brother, I said, and you didn't tell me. Ah, well, since I don't know whether you will like the idea or not. To cut the long story short, the brother who had a parcel of land there actually had two plots. Today, the brother surrendered one of the plots to the church and even made deed fence to demarcate the church from his own parcel of land that he was developing then. Today, the brother has moved down to Moe. He's no longer within this area. Now, it happened that the brother who built house in Moe was the one that became the general evangelist in that particular community, bringing more people into the church. So when you share the body and the vision with people, God might have been dropping that idea, that vision and body in the heart of some people. And these are people that God has prepared as vision carriers and body bearers. May God help us. Now, God frequently begins to speak the same thing to a number of persons. Suddenly, their concern will come to your attention. Include them in your prayer gathering as you pray specifically for this location for which God is obviously giving you a body. Then there will often be potential workers among those concerned persons. Make opportunity to give training and preparation to them. Begin to mold them into a team. If any of your contacts actually live in the area for which you are concerned, then try to knit them into your team. Endeavor to encourage the various ministry potentials in the people and encourage them to flow together in the spirit of harmony as a team. Then number three, begin to make contacts in the area. Your initial contacts should be spread as widely as possible. Remember the biblical maxim, he who will have friends must show himself friendly. That's according to Proverbs 18.24. So never regard the people to whom you are sent as the enemy or the opposition. Try to build bridges of friendship with as many of the local people as you can. Pastors, to reach people in any particular location, you cannot afford to have this us against them attitude. And let me say this to us. Don't think that you are doing the people a favor by coming to their community to start a church. You are not doing them favor. In actual fact, for them to listen to you and come to your church, they are doing you favor. Because no matter how high, how big, how heavy your anointing is, if the people in the community refuse to come to your church, who are you going to be preaching to? Chairs and benches? 
in God help us. You know, many of us ministers, we think we are doing the people a favor by pastoring them. You are not doing them a favor. They are the ones doing you a favor. But they are not the one God called. You are the one God called. And your ministry cannot be fulfilled when you don't have people that you are ministering to. They are the one that pays the money, give the offering, and do a lot of things. May God help us. Sorry if I offend some, the sensibility of some people. Then number four, start to share Jesus with people. As you become friendly with them, share Jesus with them. Once, once you have established some points of contact with people, begin to share Jesus with them in the most natural manner. All uh, day before yesterday, I was watching a Christian movie, and uh, that man of God was actually sent to all these garage boys, all these towns at Motor Park. The first time he went there, went to a particular motor park, he was dressed in suits with tie. He looked more like a banker than a pastor. Now, when those guys saw him coming to share the gospel with them, they were looking at him as somebody who has come to oppress them. And one of them said, Kilonsele, what is wrong with this one? You think we don't like suit? We like suit, but the condition we find ourselves doesn't allow us to put on suit. They were making jest of him. Now he went back and began to pray. And God spoke to him. The first time you went there, dressed up in suit, you were too loud for them to associate with you. These are guys who are putting on uh, rough jeans. And you, you are dressed up. So who do you want to oppress? So, after he prayed, he went back. Dressed in a simple trousers and a t-shirt. You know, by the time he approached them, they didn't know he was the same pastor who came the other time. And some of them were saying, ah, this one looks like a human being, no. He doesn't look like a banker or a pastor. Come on, come on, friend, let's share together. And he stood, he, he, he sat with them. They offer him cigarettes. They offer him drinks. He humbly rejected that, look, I'm here for a more serious business. Because of his simple approach, his simple dressing, they could identify with him. Because what he was putting on was actually not different from what some of them are putting on. It was so simple, and he was able to share the gospel with them, and they listened. Even though all of them did not decide for Christ that day. But yet, he has made a mark in their lives. So he went back. Some other days later, he came back. Out of about five of them, two of them got converted. One of them was killed. And when one was killed, out of the remaining two, one decided to go and begin to look for pastor so that he could be protected while the other went, one went to a harbor list to seek uh, protection and eventually he was killed even together with the harbor list sorry i've even explained all the movie i told you all the things that happened in the movie may god help us i believe we can learn lessons from that you know many of us I'm sorry to say this, we belabor ourselves too much by not taking cognizance of the fact that there are some other methods that God will introduce to us. See, some people are not here now, and yet they keep on struggling. These simple, simple things we are teaching you that will help you to plant vibrant and healthy churches We take you a long way. We introduce movies to some people they won't buy. I've heard pastors saying, I don't have time to watch movies. Hey, we are making the work to be simple for you. 
There are lessons you will learn. God will help us in Jesus' name. Oh. And that's one of the reasons. Part of the vision of church growth is also to reach out to people, to ministers especially, through gospel movies. May God help us in Jesus' name. May we have the ears to hear. So share the gospel. Don't begin to preach at them. Never condemn them. Because many of them are already under greater condemnation. Jesus always built bridges of friendship with people before he began to share the good news with them. He always avoided condemning people. Rather, he sought initially to commend them for something before he began to show them their personal needs. Some of us, we wouldn't have given our life to Christ. We wouldn't have become ministers of God today if some people had not been friendly with us to share the gospel with us. All these are our hell, gloom, and doom messages. They are not meant for sinners. Because some of them will tell you, we are already living in hell. Which other hell will be greater than the one we are living in? Now, the way you share the gospel of Christ will determine whether the people will accept that Christ or reject him. Then five, him to make converts. Among the people with whom you are able to share Jesus, Share your own personal uh, encounter, salvation experience. As you do that, you are aiming to make a convert out of them. Because many times, if we don't share our personal story, our personal experiences, some people will not believe us. You are preaching something to somebody, and you say, God can do this. Has that kind of a thing happened to you before? Then commence regular meetings in someone's home. As soon as possible, try to establish a regular meeting place in somebody's home. Try to find a place that is easily accessible to a strong sector of the neighborhood. Choose a house that is not intimidating for any reason. A place where the average type of person will feel comfortable. If you want to choose a house, don't choose a house that has I fence or eye wall that the wall is as the wall of Jericho you know and you must also be balanced in choosing the particular place we want to use don't choose a house that is too big because some people inferiority complex will not allow them to enter that place then don't choose a place that is very low because some people, some highly placed people, we feel that, uh-uh, you want me to come to that, this, this slum? No, I can't come there. So be balanced. God will help us and give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Then seven, keep the meetings informal. Keep it friendly, keep it positive and joyful. Take advantage of the fact that you are meeting in an informal location. Never try to achieve the kind of formality that many churches have. Since you are meeting in a house, make it, let the atmosphere be conducive for people to relax. This is not the conventional church meetings. Keep the gatherings informal. Do not try to perpetuate another church service. Make sure that everyone is warmly welcome. Try to make the atmosphere as user-friendly as possible. Then eight, provide opportunities for personal prayers. There are people that we have special prayer need. Give opportunities. Then there are some people. You are the one. That if they don't mind, can I come and pray with you? Because many times, when you are having meetings like that, the Lord will lay the burdens of some people in your heart. You can humbly ask them, Brother, can I pray with you? If he says yes, fine. If he says no, leave him. Don't force yourself on him. Then nine, build interpersonal relationship between people. So many people in this world are searching for trusted friends. Jesus himself is the finest, the most reliable friend. But we humans 
we need flesh and blood friends too. So the church should be the best place to find such friends. But so often, the impersonal structure we find there makes it difficult to cultivate such relationship. We should let people know that we can be friendly with one another. Then tell, share a light me together after the service. Members of the Island New Testament Church obviously shared means together. And this formed a meaningful aspect of their relationship. Eating together can break down many barriers and forge new bonds of friendship. There is something about eating together that affords an intimacy and appreciation that may not be obtained in any other way. If we sit down to eat together, I'll be relaxed because we now have relationship, we are now friends. I can, I can be assured that I am safe when I'm with you. If we can share a meal together. And those who have been trying it, they have testimonies to share along that line. May God help us in Jesus' name. The, bring in visiting speakers and believers to minister from time to time. Although the local group may be ministry sufficient in itself, it is a good idea to encourage visitors to come from time to time. It is also helpful for a small group to realize that there are many other believers beyond their own group. The visitors may share testimonies or perhaps a song, if appropriate. If possible, get someone who can preach or teach the word of God effectively. Their contribution will vary the diet of the believers and bring fresh perspective occasionally. Now, let me share a story around this. There is this fellowship that started in a locality. So, the man of God had been the one ministering with one or two people that were his team members. So one day, he just called me. He said, man of God, I want you to come and share with the people in this fellowship. He said, we are not many. Just about three, four, five families. So. I said, no problem. I will come. And at the appointed day, he came to carry me. And when I got there, the moment I got there, what woman said? Is this not this man we have been watching in movies? So, Baba, you know him. He said, ah, he's my ogre, he's my lecturer at the, by the campus of uh, ICCR. He said, eh? So, man of God, they thought I came all the way from Lagos to that fellowship at Ilife. They didn't know I already had my own program at Ilefe. And the Baba now capitalized on my being available at Ife to invite me to that fellowship to come and share with them. Because they saw a movie person, a movie star, so to say. You know, many of them, they felt relaxed. And by the time I share with them, one man said, Baba, say me there is a parcel of land here. Let's cuckoo start a church. We have seen a church that we can be fellowshipping. If you can know this man, that day I knew I was a popular person. <laughs> if you can know this man and you are associated with him, you can bring him to this our bush. And he came. Ah. You are now our pastor. To the glory of God, that fellowship has grown and is about metamorphosing into a full-fledged church. So many times when you bring people from outside, it gives you a kind of honor that you are not the one doing your thing. That there are people that shared your body and shared your vision. May God help us. Finally, keep everyone well informed about your subjects. It is essential that the vision and objectives of the group is kept clearly before them. And this can be achieved in varieties of way, ways. Obviously, teaching on the subject is the main way. But banners and slogans can sometimes be used to keep the vision before the people's eyes and before their minds. 
Now, final note. To be able to do this, I want you to take note of these five points I want to briefly share. Then we we'll go and pray. For this vision of seven million more vibrant churches to come to fulfillment, to be able to put to practice all these strategies that we have shared, number one, you must be totally obedient to God and His leading. Thank God for sp spiritual sensitivity. We are sensitive and He has laid a burden upon our hearts. Be obedient. Many times, when God gives us a body, He gives us a vision to go and do something. Many times, it, it might look like a mountain that is insurmountable. But when you go on in obedience, you see things falling in places for you. So total obedience is highly required. Then number two, have strong determination. Strong determination. That come what may, this is what God laid upon my heart and I am determined to get it fulfilled. Then three, take a decisive decision. Be decisive in your decision. Stop being, stop dilly-dallying. Stop doubting. Be decisive in your decision. God has laid this upon my heart. I am determined to do it. Then I'm taking a decisive decision. I'm going to take step. Then, number what? Number four. Have strong faith in the Lord. To bring to pass that which he has proposed. Your faith should be so strong that you speak to the mountain before you and the mountain is still there. Strong faith says you grow wings and do what? Fly over the mountain. What matter most is you get to the other side. If I speak to the mountain, mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. And the mountain looked that the sea is very far away. And stay there. Then I, I grow wings and fly over. Have strong and unshakable faith in the Lord. This is a faith-based ministry. This is a faith-based work. And to really please God, we must have strong faith in the same God. Have strong faith in the Lord. And God will bless us in Jesus' name. And finally, for this to be accomplished, you must be ready to pray unceasingly. We cannot rubbish the power and the place of prayers. Pray, pray, and pray. Let's rise up to pray. I want you to shout this loud and clear. Say, my father, my father, my father. Help me. So that the great commission will not become the great omission in my life and in my hands. Open your mouth and pray in the name of Jesus. My Father, my Father.